Amen. All right. Keep your place there in Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. So part of the chapter that I want to focus on here is verse number 4, where the Bible says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So I've talked about this before, that we're living in a day and age where <clears throat> there's a lot of different um, there's a lot of knowledge out there. There's a lot of information coming at us today. But I think that this verse may have a couple of different meanings, even for the part where it says many shall run to and fro, especially uh, lately. I think it's referring to, you know, travel in general. But I also think that it could be referring to people discerning information differently, you know, running to and fro, discerning information dis differently, making different decisions, having different conclusions on these things. So, you know, when I look at this verse and I say, and knowledge shall be increased, you know, the Bible is telling us here that there will be a time in the end when there will be a lot of knowledge that's out there. All right? So the question is, how do we sort this information? I mean, how do you make heads or tails of all of this information out there? I mean, just think of it. Think of all the information out there. Just think of just, you know, our favorite thing in the world, right? Just think of uh, YouTube. Right? Think of all the information that's on YouTube today. I'm sure that you all know, maybe some of you are these people, that you, know, you all know someone who spends too much time on YouTube. You know, someone that's always coming up with some kind of weird, harebrained thing. You're smiling because you know these people. But they're, they're, they've got something that you know, they heard somewhere, and it's because they found something on YouTube. And the thing is, you know, there's all kinds of, of wrong information on YouTube. I mean, just think about all the stupid theories out there. I mean, just the big ones, right? I mean, like on like aliens, for example. Or even, you know, like on Bible stuff, like 450 foot tall giants and, and things like that. You know, I mean, we've all met people who have fallen into this. My favorite one, I didn't even know existed until I moved to California, is the flat earth thing, right? I mean, who would have thought that these people exist? But they're out there, man. And it's on YouTube. I mean, you can watch. You can watch, I mean I, just, I mean, I heard about it a few years ago, and I looked up on YouTube. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff out there. People have, you know, documentaries and uh, illustrations and all these kind of things showing, you know, the pancake of the earth and all this kind of stuff and the ice wall and, and all, uh, you know, the whole thing. So, I mean, the point is, is that there's all this information. You could spend hundreds, maybe even thousands of hours just watching YouTube videos on the flat earth. That's just one stupid theory. And that's just one, you know, media outlet, YouTube. So, I mean, the point is that we're living in a day and age where there is so much information coming at us. I mean, what are we to do with this? How are we to handle this? That's what I want to talk about this evening. The title of the sermon this evening is Discerning the Truth. Discerning the truth. In a time where there is so much information, how do we discern the truth? How can we filter this stuff, right? So the first question is, you know, what is the truth? What is the truth? And the first thing that we know, you know, the Word of God is the truth. The Word of God is the truth. Amen. If we do a Bible study on the word truth, the Bible says, you know, John 14, turn to John 14, chapter 6. John 14, chapter 6. The Word of God is the ultimate truth. The Word of God is the ultimate truth. In John 14, chapter 6, the Bible says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Go to John chapter 8, verse number 30, 32. So Jesus says that I am, he is literally the truth. He calls himself there. So what is the truth? Well, Jesus is the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth, period. Go to John chapter 8 and look at verse number 32. So we know that Jesus is the truth. In John chapter 8 and verse number 32, the Bible says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So Jesus says that not only is He the literal truth, but that that truth, the truth, will make you free. Now, isn't that true? Amen. Isn't that true? I mean, Jesus literally, if you're saved today, is literally freed you from sin and death. Yeah. 
You know, you no longer have, we learned in Romans, you know, you no longer have to be a slave to sin. You're freed from that. And he's, he's freed you from death. You will never experience the second death. You will never go to hell if you're saved. You will never get that. Now turn to John chapter 17. So, Jesus is the truth. That truth will make you free. Even if you don't feel free in California today, you're actually still free. You're free through Jesus Christ. Turn to John chapter 17 and look at verse number 16. The Bible says this, it says, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus talking to the Father here, and he's saying that the word of God is truth. The word of God is truth, Jesus says. Now turn to John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1. 1, 1. So Jesus says, I am the truth. And then Jesus says, the word of God is truth. Well, which is it? Well, of course, that we know that it's both. In John chapter 1, in verse number 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word of God is God. We know that, right? We talked about, you know, uh, a week ago, we talked about how God literally spoke the Word, the world into existence. He created the world through His Word. Look at John chapter 1 and verse number 14. And the Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, and the glory as if the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus Christ is the Word becoming flesh. So Jesus is the truth. The truth will make you free. And then the Bible says that the Word of God is the truth, which is Jesus. So, you know, God used that word. God used the word to create the world. He used Jesus. Jesus created the world. So, we know that the word of God is true. We know that we have the word of God here. We know that God's promise to pre preserve his word is in front of us in your King James Bible. So, that's the first thing. We have the Bible to use as a filter to all this information. Okay. Now look, I mean, we, we looked at um, a lot of different things that we use the Bible as a filter on in the American Heresy series. And, you know, it's compared to what we're going to get into next in the sermon tonight, this is the easy part, using the King James Bible to filter the truth. Look, filtering theology through the King James Bible is fairly easy as long as you know what the Bible says. So this is why, you know, we talk about in a church like this, we're not only going to preach the Bible hard at you, but things that you're going to hear preached at you are that it is important that you read the Bible. Amen. It's important that you have personal Bible time, that you're reading through the Bible, that you've read, the, you know, if you want to know what the Bible says, you have to read all of it. Amen. You have to read it from the front to the back, and then you have to read it from the front to the back again. It's an infinite book. Things will keep popping up at you. Things you'll, you'll, you'll always notice new things in the Bible. I'm always shocked at the things that I always notice in the Bible when I read it again, the things that my family notices in the Bible, because guess what? When other people read it through several times, they'll notice things that you didn't notice. But that's how you can... The, the filter's no good to you if you don't know what it, how to use it, what it says. Okay? So look, all these theologies, think of the Catholics and the, the Seventh-day Adventists and the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, so easy to filter through the King James Bible. It's so easy. Because, look, those aren't even, most of those religions or false religions aren't even really deep doctrine. They're just, they're, they're, they're fundamentally messing up the simplicity of the gospel. So, look, you have to know what the Bible says. It's important. So that's the first thing. The first thing is that we know that the Word of God is true. So let's dig a little bit deeper tonight. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Don't get too excited. It's not what you think. <laughs> Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Now put your thinking caps on. Get your calculators out. Romans chapter 1. Look down at verse number 19. Where the Bible says this. It says... Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. So we talked about this in the sermon on Romans chapter 1, that God has given evidence to people. 
He has given evidence to people of his existence. No one has an excuse in this world. No one can die and go to hell and say, I didn't have a chance. Because the Bible tells us that everybody had the chance. And the Bible is telling us one of those chances here. Look at verse number 20. <coughs> Excuse me. The Bible says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So, I mean, verse number 20 is kind of is a little bit deep. And we, you know, we generally kind of just talk about creation when we look at verse number 20. But let's dig into the actual words that the Bible is saying here. The Bible says the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Isn't that a strange statement? That the invisible things, these are invisible things, right? But they're clearly seen, right? How are they clearly seen? Well, the Bible explains. It says being understood by what? By the things that are made. So these invisible things are seen by the things that are made. You ever think about what that means? This is more than just the trees and the flowers. It, God is talking about that these invisible things are literal evidence of Him. So let's go beyond the trees and the flowers and let's look at these invisible things. Now, let me ask you a question. Can you see gravity? Can you see it? Look, look down at verse number 20 again. The Bible says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Can you see electricity? Can you see energy? Can you see work that energy does? Well, I guess you kind of can see that one. Can you see, oh, here's a good one, can you see heat transfer? If I put a cup of coffee on the back table and immediately when I put that cup of coffee that's at 105 degrees or whatever that coffee is at, immediately that cup of coffee, we've talked about this in the sermon uh, before too, it will immediately start going towards the room temperature, 70 degrees. Can you see that happening? Can you see it? You can't. You can't see it. So how do we know? How do we know this? How do we know gravity is real? I have a, a demonstration here. Because we can observe it. That's how I know that that invisible thing of God, it, it can be clearly seen when I drop the pen. We can observe it through experimentation. I just did an experiment. I just tested gravity. It works. We're, we're still good. Man has even invented a way to model these invisible things of God. Man has invented a way to figure out or to model, to see how the invisible things of God are going to work. That, that way that man has invented to model this is called mathematics. Okay? These invisible things are, are things that we can literally gain understanding of. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 26. People in the Bible gained understanding of these things. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 26. One of my favorite kings, and I probably give him a little bit too much credit here for some of the things that he did, but 2 Chronicles chapter 26, we see King Uzziah in the Bible. And look at verse number 14. And the Bible says, And Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host shields and spears and helmets and habergeons and bows and slings to cast stones. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal. Think about it. And his name spread far abroad, and he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Look, think about it. He created these machines, these engines, the Bible calls it, to defy gravity by taking these massive stones that had a lot of mass and defying gravity by, by casting these great stones. You know, a, a catapult, it comes to mind. 
He made these great machines using, you know, engineering, the laws of physics. You know, but look, we don't invent the laws of physics. I didn't invent gravity. Uzziah did not invent gravity and then make a machine that, you know, defied gravity. Things like gravity, mass, heat transfer, energy, work, electricity, these are all things that are laws of the universe. These are the invisible things of God. These are the invisible things of God. These are things that are there. They're happening to us. They're things that aren't seen. Right? They're things that aren't seen, but they can be observed by the things that are made. You see what I'm saying? They can be observed when I drop the pen. They can be observed when I make a machine. When Uzziah made the machine to throw, he, could, he can see that gravity still would eventually take that stone back down. So he could see these things. He could experiment with these. And now we can model these things with math, with mathematics. But I've often thought that, that as an engineer that I'm just basically trying to re, re, reverse engineer inside of God's universe, if you think about it that way. Because, look, I have to model how all these things are going to happen to me. And if I don't model them properly, it's not going to go well. Now, I don't talk about this a lot, but several years ago, for several years, I was in the field of research and development. And it was my job to basically invent new technologies for the company that I worked for. But not only did I invent new technologies for the company that I worked for, but I also evaluated technologies from other people. Okay, so I evaluated people would want to come and sell our company these machines, as the Bible would say, these engines, as the Bible would say. And they wanted to sell this to us, so I had to kind of dig in and see, look, I've met a lot of mad scientists, literally, in my life. And let me, let me just say this, I've met a lot of these guys that they would come and they would pitch these things, and I had to figure out if what they were saying was true. So what did I do? What did I do? I used a biblical principle, is what I did. Look back at verse number 20. When somebody comes to us and says, hey, we have this great machine, we want to sell it to your company, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do this for you, and it's going to work this way, and it'll only cost you this much money, and it can create this type of energy. I would have to figure that out. So the first thing that I would do is I would use math that we know of the invisible things of him so I would use math to model that what these invisible things are known to follow. Did you know that I can come up with a mathematical equation to show you exactly how much time it will take that pen to hit the floor after I drop it? Exactly. You can model it that close. But you have to get you know, the mass of the pen correct. And you have to put in certain variables to be correct. Okay. The second thing I would do, so first we would model with math the invisible things. That's what we would model, to look at these ideas from these scientists. The second thing that we would do is look at the thing that was made. So we would model the invisible things, the laws of the universe that God put in front of us, that we know how to model, and then we would look at the actual things that were made. In short, the math must match the machine, is what I would say. Now look, I've seen, and, and typically it was pretty easy, and here's why. Because, I, I mean, I've seen some wild PowerPoint presentations, man. I mean, like, this thing will, like, I mean, this thing will take it to the moon and back on a gallon of gasoline, right? I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. And I'm like, all right, well, you know, um, first thing we would do is we would just look at the math and all this kind of stuff. But for 90% of these, these types of things, there was no machine. And the reason there was no machine is because the math wouldn't work. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. The math wouldn't match the machine, thus they couldn't build that machine. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it's spectacular presentations. I mean, the most famous one of these, not, not in my experience, but the most famous one of them that maybe some of you have heard about, that I'm sure there's YouTube videos on it, is perpetual motion. You know, people that are pitching that they've come up with a perpetual motion machine. A perpetual motion machine is a machine that will, that will keep moving in a closed system without adding energy to it. But it's impossible. It defies the laws of physics. It de defies the laws of thermodynamics because 
with friction and heat losses, you always have to keep adding energy. You always have to keep filling your car with gas. Because there's nothing that's more than 100% efficient. There's nothing that's 100% efficient. So, I mean, there's a lot of, the point I'm trying to get at on this second point is that we know the Bible's true is the first point, and then we know what is observed. God's observable universe we know is true. All else we must be skeptical. Okay? All else we must be skeptical. So let me tell you something. There's a lot, and I've, I've met a lot of these people. There are a lot of technical false prophets out there. We know, we've studied, we have gone through sermon series on spiritual false prophets. There are a lot of technical false prophets out there. And I'm going to explain to you later in the sermon, you know, why that is. Okay? But look, let me give you an example of this in this whole coronavirus situation that we're in right now. Okay? There's a lot of... And look, I'm not going to stand up here and say I know what's going to happen. Because I don't. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you that I don't know what I don't know. I'm not going to come up here and tell you that I'm some doctor and I know what's going to happen. Because I don't. But here's what I do know. What scares people most about this virus situation is, is two things that I see. It's the number of cases out there and it's mortality. How many of these cases die? How many of these people that get the disease die? Okay, now look, I have an equation. Here's how you calculate that. You take the number of deaths and you divide it by the number of known cases and you get whatever this mortality rate is, how many people die that get the disease, okay? The problem is this, half of that equation is unknown. The number of known cases is completely unknown, yet they keep reporting it and showing it rise and rise and rise and rise. I'm going to give you an exact example in Fresno here. I'm going to read you a news article from Thursday. You remember in, on Thursday, before the whole state shut down, Fresno shut down, right? While we were actually at church, Fresno shut, you know, Fresno shut down before, then, I mean, it's so hard to understand, I mean, to keep track of it. It was like every, every five hours, something new got taken away from us. But look, ABC, Thurs ABC 30 in Fresno reported the story this way. I'm going to read it for you. The city of Fresno has issued an emer er emergency order telling everyone to shelter in place starting at 12.01 a.m. Thursday and lasting through March 31st. But there's a long list of exemptions for essential functions. This is the whole essential, non-essential. Mayor Lee Brand called it an unprecedented problem and said his attitude has changed over the weeks, especially after meeting with other big city mayors. I'm not even going to address that, but that's a sermon in itself. Quote, we are literally making life and death decisions here, Brand said. He says public health officials have told mayors, listen to this now, listen, right here. He says public health officials have told mayors, all these big city mayors, because he said he's been talking to big city mayors all across the country. Public health officials have told mayors that because of lack of testing, that they should take whatever their local numbers of confirmed cases are and multiply them by 50. I'm going to read it again. He says they should take whatever their local numbers of confirmed cases are and multiply them by 50. Look, that's crazy. That means, you know what that means? If you take China's known cases, and you take this equation, this simple equation of known cases divided by people that died. And look, nobody wants anyone to die, okay? I understand that one life is valuable. We go out soul winning. That, but I'm just talking about what we're seeing in the news. If you take known cases in China, number of people that have died in China, you multiply that bottom number by 50, the mortality rate goes to about the same as the common flu. And, are, and am I saying that, that the mortality rate of the coronavirus is the same as the common flu? No. So what do I think it is? I don't know. That's my point. I don't know. If you're taking a number and multiplying it by 50, you don't know either. 
You have no idea. Look, we don't know if the 50 number is right. But that number, that low number, that, that, look, if you multiply it times 50, you get a much smaller number. I mean, hopefully, you know, look, my, the only thing that they know is the top of that equation, which is the actual people that have died. That's all that they know. That's probably a fairly accurate number. Because somebody that is going to die of coronavirus is in bad shape. They're going to go to a hospital. They're going to get tested. And then, you know, unfortunately, they pass away. And they know that that's a confirmed death. So they know that. So, look, hopefully, you know, that 50 number is low. I mean, but, but they're multiplying it times 50. But they're not reporting that mortality rate. They're reporting the mortality rate of the people that have just been tested. Yep. You see what I'm saying? Yep. It's dishonest. Yep. It's technical fraud. And they know what they're doing. It's crazy. Look, there's a there's a the cruise ship that came back, the the Diamond Princess. They're saying that, and here's some reasons why they have no idea what that number is. It's not just because uh, lack of testing. I mean, that may be the broad reason. But look, the Diamond Princess came back, and they reported that over 50% of the people didn't even have any sy sy symptoms. They tested everybody on the ship because they were concerned about you know the the quarantines and everything, 50% of the people were asymptomatic. Amen. So if you have no symptoms, are you going to go get tested? If you have a, a slight cough, are you going to go get tested for coronavirus? Are you kidding me? I mean, it's not going to happen. Well, it gives us, it gives us hope, you know, that there's a lot of people out there that are, are, are getting it and getting over it. You know, that's, I mean, there's some hope there. You know, and moving on, there, there will be some immunity in the community in a few weeks. I mean, that gives some hope, but that's just a theory. Look, that's just a theory. But look, they just keep reporting this number of known cases went up 10,000 today. Yep. Guess what? The more people they test, the more it's going to go up. Yep. But times 50. Times 50. So look, we have to look at what we can observe. All right? We know, like... I think we can pretty much say that this is very dangerous for older people. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, that's a, a known at this point. But, you know, the only things that can be known is what can be observed, folks. And that's how many people have died from it. Okay? There are a lot of problems with exactly half of the equation. <laughs> There's two variables. And one of them is it might be, I mean, think about it. We used to run simulations on circuits, okay? And there was like dozens and dozens and dozens of variables that we would plug into these simulations. Because before we go out and spend millions of dollars of design time, we're going to make sure that we come up with a design that's going to work, or at least get close to working. You see what I'm saying? So we model it with math. And we put all these variables in, dozens of variables, sometimes hundreds of variables. But we used, we used to have a saying. And the saying was this, garbage in, garbage out. Meaning if we missed, missed those variables and those variables were wrong, the circuit wouldn't work. We would go build it and it wouldn't work. Period. I mean, and I'm talking about, when we were talking about certain variables being wrong, we're talking about maybe 2 or 3%. I mean, 50, we're talking about 5,000%. You would be laughed out of any kind of profession that's trying to build anything with these kind of numbers. Yet this is what's being used to panic people. It bothers me. It bothers me. So, Jesus warned us about misinformation. Did you know that? Turn to Matthew 24. Jesus warned us. Jesus said that people will constantly be telling you things that aren't true. Go to Matthew chapter 24. Don't, don't get me wrong about this sermon tonight. Don't you sit up here and sit in your chair and think that I, I know what's going on. But look, I know when, when there's a garbage variable somewhere. Amen. I used to do it for a living. I mean, I know. I can recognize it. And that's why I'm sharing it with you. Amen. Matthew 24, verse number 5. Matthew 24, verse number 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Jesus says that there's going to be people out there that come and say that they're the Messiah. Okay, go down to verse number 24. And this, these are the majority of the ones that we see today are, you know, in uh, verse number 24. And he says, in verse number 26, I'm sorry, but we'll start at verse number 24. So, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, 
And they shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, where if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Look, this is all these people that we talked about weeks ago claiming that Jesus was coming back on a certain date. I mean, they claim Jesus is coming back on this date. They claim that, you know, David is coming back on a certain date and all the patriarchs are coming back. You know, you got to build me a big mansion and, you know, because David and all the patriarchs are coming back. And you know what? I'll live in it. I'll live in it until they get here. Right? I mean, these are the types of people that, that Jesus is warning us about. People that claim that the hot dog stand guy I told you guys about last week. I mean, you go to get a hot dog and the guy's trying to lay hands on you and make you, you know, this is holy ground and he's all this stuff. I mean, look, these people are walking around right now. Jesus warned us about these spiritual false prophets. But I'm telling you, there are a lot of other types of false prophets too. The spiritual false prophets, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. They're pretty easy to spot. They're pretty easy to spot. If, once again, what's the prerequisite? You know what the Bible says. If you know what the Bible says. Look at Deuteronomy 18. Look at verse number 22. The Bible says, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Look, these people that were fooled by all these false prophets and all these cults, like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses and even the Catholics, look, they may have come into it, you know, just silly and just not knowing, right? But if they would have known what the Bible said the first time that one of those false prophets said something that didn't come true, they should have been gone, just like that. And that, that's the way it should be with you. You should know the Bible. So if somebody gets up and says something that's not true, that's it. You know, if I come up here and I say, you know what, um, Abraham is going to walk through that door in six months if you give me $10,000. Yeah, I mean, if, if Abraham doesn't walk through the door, first of all, you know, you know I'm, I'm being over the top. But I mean, the point is that, you know, when it doesn't happen, you know. It's easy, right? It's black and white. It's easy to discern. But these scientific false prophets are a little bit harder for people to, to discern. All right, the problem is, is that people see someone with doctor in front of their name, they see someone with a white coat, they see someone, you know, they, and they assume that everything that that person says is true. Let me tell you something, it is not the case. It is not the case. I, I, have, I have personally worked with and met these people. And there's a lot, of, think about it, engineering, it's math. There's a lot of engineering fraud out there. But I'm not, I'm not a doctor. But there's a lot of engineering frauds. People pitching things that aren't true. And if you're not you know, sharp and know what you're talking about and looking for, they'll get you. They will, they will get you to buy into what they're doing. I've had a rule over the last 15 years. I call it the 10% rule. Okay? And it's been true in engineering. And I would be shocked if it wasn't true in the, in the medical field as well, especially with some of the doctors that I've met out there. Okay? It's the 10% rule. The 10%, there's 10% of, of engineers and probably doctors that are the ones grinding out the details and coming up and doing research and coming up and building new things. The other 90% are just following along and doing what the guy before them did. They're just, they're, they're average at best. I'm talking about the 10% that are thinking outside the box, that are coming up with the new stuff that you see every day. They're coming up with the new ways to communicate and the new ways to travel and all these different things. They're the ones that are actually solving the problems, 10%. And I think that that's actually generous. Kind of scary, huh? Because that means that there's 90% out there that could easily be part of this technical fraud, technical false prophet group. So there's a lot of misinformation, folks. And look, let me tell you something. That 10%, I'm speaking from experience here, that 10% is never the one standing in front of the camera. Never. They're never the one, you know, standing up, you know, being the, the, the voice piece or whatever. You know, that's why, I, look, I don't know if you saw the FW, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug somebody right now, but I don't know if you saw the FWBC LA video from Dr. Ellithorpe on this whole thing. But look, that lady, 
knows what she's talking about. Amen. And I can tell, look, she's done her homework. Her numbers were right. I checked. You can tell she's done research. And, and here's the thing. Here's the thing that really set her apart. She had solutions. She had things that, that she's come up with, that, that she's researched and tested and studied and observed. I mean, this is someone, that is someone who is looking for answers. That is someone who has used a technical career to look for answers. I can recognize it. And what she said was true. I checked. But guess what? She's probably never going to make it on the evening news. It's a shame. It's a shame. Because someone that goes on the news to say, well, at this point, uh, we just can't say. We just don't know. Sensationalism is what sells. Pictures of red viruses with spikes gets you to click that article. You know, I mean, every single article has a picture of like all these doctors in coats lined up just waiting for the masses of people to be brought into the, the hospitals, the hospital ships, because all the hospitals are going to overflow. Look, I hope it doesn't happen. I don't know. But it's not a reality right now. And that's the reality that they're pitching. Of, of false variables. You see what I'm saying? I mean, you would think it's real, reading the news. You would think it's real. And people think it's real, by the way. That's why people are so concerned. So no one knows how bad it'll get. But right now, you know, right now, it's not, it's not there. They don't know. They don't know. So in conclusion this evening, what do we know is true? We know the Bible's true. Hopefully you knew that before you got here. The Word of God is truth. We know that pestilence is used as judgment. We know that poor leadership is another part of you know, the judgment package. You know, look, I, I'm not saying this isn't serious. That's not what I'm talking about. But you need to be careful with the things that you read. Amen. And that's why I'm telling you this. You need to be careful. Look, there's a lot of panic and propaganda out there today but most things that you read in the media are wrong. And let me give you another example of this. There was a reporter last year that came to the Red Hot Preaching Conference. And I knew she was there. Pastor told a couple of us that she was there. She went soul winning um, with Miss Joanne and Pastor. She's a reporter from the LA Times. She blended right in. She wore, uh, I think she wore skirts and she stayed there for the whole conference and she was doing a story on the conference. And I'm like, this is great. I mean, she went, I mean, she went soul winning with Miss Joanne. Joanne. Miss Joanne got somebody saved, I think, when they were out soul winning. I mean, have you ever met uh, Miss Joanne Jimenez? I mean, she's the nicest person in the world. And then she saw the Red Hot Preaching Conference. And there's like, if you've never been there, there's tons of kids there, and they're constantly playing games in the back. It's like the best thing ever. And I'm like, you know what? She's going to see this. And she's going she's gonna to be, this is, how could this be wrong? She's going to think. Even if she's the most hardened liberal, I was thinking to myself. And, I mean, just the whole atmosphere of the Red Hot Preaching Conference, you know it, you've been there. And I'm like, how could anyone think that this is something that's not wonderful? You know, from the kids to the adults to everything, right? And she got to hang out with the best people. Not, I mean, I shouldn't even say that. But I mean, she got to hang out with, you know, you know what I'm saying? She got to hang out with the pastor and his wife, you know? And, I mean, I'm just like, this is going to be exciting. I mean, she came out and she just trashed the church. And she trashed the kids. I mean, that's a hard-hearted person. But the point is, you read the article, the story came out, and you read the article, it was the opposite of what was true. You see? The same thing happened in the 2016 protests at, at Verity Baptist Church. If you go and you talk to the men and women that walked past those crowds of all those Sodomites and all those Benjamites supporting them, and you hear them tell you the things that they were trying to show the kids, the things that they were trying to do in front of the kids, to try to get the children to see these things. We have experienced this here. Not as bad as that, 
But when you read the news articles about it, you don't see any of that. You see, what you read in the, in the media is, is, I hate to use the word, but I'm at the term, I'm going to use it. It's fake news. Amen. I mean, there's a lot of fake news out there. It's the opposite of reality. I mean, it would be nice if we could get some practical advice. Hey, if you're going to ruin the entire country, can we get some practical advice, please? That's what I loved about the doctor from FWBCLA. The, you know, uh, the, the, the advice from our leaders is, hey, wash your hands. Hey, thanks. Tomorrow are we doing colors and shapes? I mean, wash your hands. Thank you. You know, now you're broke. Or we're going to ruin your life now. Yeah. And the entire country. Yep. So, we know that the physical universe is true. Things that can be tested and observed. That will show you, look, just watch that, watch that my advice to you as a church family is to watch the daily death rate. That number is known, and that will tell you when we're coming out of this thing. Okay, that's the number you can count on. You know, when you see that, when you see that, and we don't want anyone to die, I don't want to sound callous about it, okay? But that's the number that will show you. That's the number in the countries that have already come out of this, in China. You know, if you can believe what's coming out of China. But I mean, when that number starts coming down, that will let you know that either everyone in the country is immune or it's, it's, it's dying because of the flu season's over or whatever. I mean, who knows, right? But my point is that's, a, that's the only reliable number that I see right now. That's the only reliable number that I see right now. And then, you know, we can all have our theories and that's not, you know, what I'm going to do from here. But I mean, pray that God would just lift his hand off the country. That's all, because that, that's where it's really coming down to. Is it's, it, we always kind of have to come back to that. You know, we're, we, we're complaining about what's happening and, and, and the, the freedoms that have been taken from us and all these things, but really we just have to remember that, you know what, this is God's doing. Okay, this is God's doing. We don't have to like it, but let's pray that, you know, God will lift his hand off this country so we can get back to church. Amen. So we can not have ninja church. Yeah, and we can get back to, you know, church with lights. So we can have organized soul winning in California. Amen. I mean, look, pray to God. Pray to God that he would lift the plague so we can get out and get some people saved. Amen. That, we can, that we can get out and, and go soul winning and worship and grow in Christ. I mean, I think that that is a prayer that, that I, I, I would hope that God would at least consider if enough people are praying it. Let's just remember that. So please, discern these things. Be careful what you're reading. Um, there's a lot of things that nobody knows right now. There's a lot of uncertainty right now. And just maybe while you're sheltering in place, and we were talking about this in my house today, here's some, here's some more advice. Maybe as you're sheltering in place, just unplug from it for a while, for a few days. You know, maybe just spend some time with your family, play some games, things like that. It can, it can be, it's happened to me too, okay? There's nothing wrong with just pulling away from it and just turning off the computer and just putting your phone away and, you know, go drive around and look at the lockdown with your family. That's what I do. <laughs> All right? And pray. Just pray. Prayers. God hears our prayers. Prayers work. All right? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, this evening. We thank you for allowing us to come here and uh, hear your word, Lord. And we just thank you for um, the freedoms that we do have, Lord, and, and just uh, hope that this ends soon. Give wisdom to the people that need wisdom, Lord. And uh, be, you know, be with people that are sick, Lord, and just help, um, help keep people from this illness. And, and it's, it's your decision, Lord. Um, it's in your hands, and we're here. Um, whatever you decide, whatever you decide is right. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.